Hi, I'm Donna McNeil. I'm the Episcopal Campus Missioner to MSU and the Associate Rector at All Saints Episcopal Church. And this morning, I am delighted to get to talk to Dr. Mindy Morgan from MSU. She is the Graduate Program Director and Associate Professor of Anthropology, as well as an affiliated faculty member of the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program at MSU. Thanks so much, Mindy. Thank you. What else would you like to tell us about yourself? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me for the conversation today. Uh, so just a little bit of kind of uh, kind of positioning of, of who I am and what I do. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm an associate professor of anthropology, but I do, um, I work at the intersections of linguistic anthropology and sociocultural anthropology. And so a lot of my questions, a lot of the research that I'm focusing on is really kind of how language and, and meaning systems mm -hmm. um, get transmitted from, from different communities. And I've had a longstanding um, both affiliation and um, respect for indigenous communities. I myself was born, uh, well, raised in, in Colorado and Wyoming, um, kind of on the on the fringes of a lot of uh, native communities and had an opportunity in my, my older teenage years and then young undergraduate years um, to work at the Rosebud Reservation up in South Dakota. Yeah. Um, and that kind of motivated me um, and a lot of questions about how I, as what I perceived as a mountain Westerner could know so little about Native communities while living um, amongst and beside Native communities. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of motivated me both in my undergraduate years and then into my graduate years to really kind of understand, um, first of all, why that erasure exists and then how we can best kind of uh, undo it. So that's just oh, a little thank bit you so much. Kind of about, my, uh, about my, my background, so. As you know, I'm from New Mexico and grew up as well among and around Native American communities. And, and as white folks, our relationship is just different. We can be right in the middle and, and know so little. Um, so I, I understand that and so appreciate um, the opportunity to learn more um, and, and to learn even my blind sides. Um, I always find that um, fascinating and challenging in, yeah. I, I think, the I, right ways. <laughs> absolutely. And I'm, you know, I, I, I always want to kind of preface this that I'm 25 years into this career and still have blind sides and I'm still right. learning con continually from from the communities with whom I work. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, I thought because MSU has done this um, so intentionally and so well, I thought we should um, share the land acknowledgement that MSU has put together. And so I will read that, um, which you and I both understand and take seriously. We collectively acknowledge that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, three fires confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples. In particular, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. We recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who are forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of the American Indian and indigenous peoples. So you said that you have worked around um, the issues of language preservation and acquisition. Tell me a little bit more about that and why it matters. Sure, absolutely. And I'm gonna go, uh, give a little bit, again, kind of a little bit more of a um, autobiographical sort of, of sketch. Right. As I mentioned, I was I some of my earlier kind of experiences in my my late teen and, and my early undergraduate years was in South Dakota and particularly at um, the Rosebud Reservation, which is in, uh, which is in kind of the South Central uh, South Dakota. And I became very interested in the tribal college movement. And mm -hmm. you know, the tribal college movement really came out in the, the late 1960s and through the 70s. And by the time I was there in the early 1990s, um, really had reached kind of a, a, a really important sort of milestone. Um, tribal colleges had become tribal universities, they were offering master's degrees and really were the hearts of communities. And so I was really interested because I had known um, in my own kind of reading and, and so forth about the absolute atrocities of the boarding school era and, um, and the ways that uh, many, many um, indigenous children were, uh, were harmed by the Western educational system. And so I found the tribal colleges as this really interesting sort of places that were fully enmeshed in community life um, but yet still also really trying to kind of prepare students for, um, uh, you know, for, for a variety of careers, both on and off reservation. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I actually went to graduate school to kind of look at. I was interested in education. I was looking interested in, in, these, in these wonderful sort of institutions and how they 
um, you know, how they, how they kind of grew. And my advisor said, you have to look at the language. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what a tribal college is, the heart of the tribal college is the language. And that really impacted me. Now, I do have to give some history. This was in 1990. Mm -hmm. Well, actually a little bit, a few years later. <laughs> so 1992, 1993 that, that I was told this. There was a lot of movement around um, indigenous language revitalization. In 1990, um, the federal government for the first time ever acknowledged its role and responsibility in um, limiting and endangering indigenous languages and passed the, the Native, like, Native Languages Act of 1990. Wow. Um, that was followed in 1991 by um, uh, a federal, uh, another, another act that actually gave money for language revitalization. But it's weird to kind of say that it starts there because it doesn't. It starts actually in the communities and with, with community grassroots who, um, language speakers who knew um, that their languages were no longer being passed on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of grassroots kind of community organizing and activism around language maintenance and revitalization. So you and mean that, that kids growing up in communities, even within tribes and on reservations, were not learning the indigenous language. They were speaking language um, in Spanish, often in New Mexico, but not their indigenous language. Precisely. And yes, and, and absolutely. And, and one of the things that's kind of interesting, or at least for me, which was, which was remarkable to, to know about, is that, of course, when we think about indigenous languages in the United States or what became the United States, you know, there's, so, there's hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds. Um, there's probably... And this is where the linguistic anthropologist in me, <laughs> it's hard to say what, you know, how you want to kind of divide things up. And I, right. I tend to not want to divide, but there's still, um, even today, are well over, you know, 150 languages, indigenous wow. languages that are still spoken. And the, the narrative and the still narrative is spoken, not that still, at one time, but are still spoken. Are still spoken. There were probably over 500 um, wow. prior to across the continent, prior to European um, colonization. Oh. But uh, so, so there's many, many that have been lost or um, yeah. as, as many community members say that they like, that it, they're sleeping, they're not necessarily gone, but, yeah. but sleeping for now. Oh, like um, but so there's a, a common sort of narrative and, and the narrative's not true. And that is of course that with uh, um, the movement onto, uh, so the, the forced schooling, the boarding schools, the forced separation of children from their parents, one of the main objectives was to get kids to not speak their indigenous language. Mm -hmm. um, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, there was a lot of stigma um, against speaking indigenous languages. The popular conception was that they were still not, um, that they weren't as good as um, English, which of course was, was is, is absolutely not true by any right. shape. But, um, but the, and so then there was a lot of stigma. Um, students were, were told not to speak it, and, and there was a, an interruption in that transmission. So that's the popular story. It's not untrue, but it's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. The truth is, is that communities did keep their languages going. Um, they went uh, into different spaces, either uh, uh, esoteric ones, spiritual ones, um, home life. Um, women, not unsurprisingly, kept languages much more as they cared for generations right. upon generations. Um, and so the languages actually were maintained despite um, despite the, the the overt attempts to to eradicate them. Um, the languages really did survive. What was interesting, and and they survived through through the early twentieth century through these mm -hmm. policies. They even survived through the termination program in the nineteen fifties mm -hmm. and the movement of of many um, indigenous communities off reservations and into um, urban spaces. Okay, they they yeah. continue to, to to survive. One of the things that actually really did end up interrupting them was um, so even, and so this is where then, as I was mentioning, the tribal colleges come out in the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s. That's when people realized that a lot of the elders who were speaking, that there wasn't transmission going on. Mm -hmm. And in some of the spaces where I've worked, they say, you know, they, they were able to maintain languages through all of these really overt um, programs to, for their elimination. But what ended up really disrupting were things like highways <laughs> that, yeah. In the post-war period, that ended up bisecting the um, the reservation lands, where people could move off and on much more quickly. And then cable TV, um, right. when so a lot of things then kind of interrupted in the in the 70s and then in the 80s, where you saw this real precipitous decline um, in in indigenous language speaking. And then that's what then kind of motivated communities to really say this is a this is a critical issue that we need to um, that we need to do something about. And so a lot of programs um, came out and they were buried. There were a lot of community focused programs. Um, some of them were in schools, some of them were in like nurseries. 
Um, some of them were, were, were attempted at older adults, but, but they're really kind of, there was this groundswell of, of, um, of work that was being done. That as often is the case, it's the, it's the people in the communities and working very hard finally got the ear and the attention. Right. Right. Um, it finally um, bubbles up. Way it finally up bubbles yeah. up. And in the 1990s, it finally bubbled up to the point where um, the U.S. had a reckoning um, about kind of their complicity in the eradication of the languages and the importance of actually uh, providing communities with support and resources to, to maintain that. So that's actually so I feel always when I think about my history, I feel extraordinarily lucky that I was truly just happened to be kind of in the right place at the right time. Okay. Um, where there were a lot of programs focusing on um, on on maintaining languages. So back to my advisor. That was a long digression. Back no, to my that was advisor. great. That was great. I learned so much just in that those few minutes. <laughs> but when he said that, that to me, that is really the heart of the, the communities. He was right. I mean, there was no question about it. Yeah. Um, at Rosebud, um, the uh, the uh, the the university there, um, they're absolutely in that community. It's Lakota is the language, um, but. Yeah, Lakota studies, but the but everyone kind of operated within within the language, and so I decided I needed to learn more. If that was what I was interested in, I needed to learn more. So that then motivated me to to actually use some more formal linguistics training, um, mm -hmm. where I could also, as a person who was who recognized my own so I'm not part of the community and right. recognized my own privilege in the sense that I had the opportunity to to learn that what were the skills that were necessary um, that I could use to to kind of forward forward this. Um, and mm -hmm. one of them was the ability to actually kind of translate some of the language materials into some pedagogical materials. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I can talk more about this, but one of the things uh, is also understanding the complicity of the discipline of anthropology. Um, anthropologists mm -hmm. in the, you know, for a very long time um, throughout the, you know, really from the, the late 1800s, but primarily in the, in the, ninth, in the late 19th century. Along um, with, it's worth saying, often missionaries, that, that missionaries and anthropologists, like, like missionaries and militaries, often traveled together. They were very intertwined. So particularly as a Christian community in the West, it's this is a really important conversation. Absolutely. And sometimes the missionaries were the anthropologists. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and exactly. so there's so much historical collection of indigenous language material all the way from just kind of rudimentary word, word lists to primarily, mm -hmm. um, I mean, not exclusively, but a lot of the uh, the Jesuit orders in particular. Right. Who That's did exactly what I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah, who did the grammatical sketches of indigenous languages. And so what I realized is that in the 1990s is that there was this tremendous amount of material um, there that were languishing in archives or in um, museums or things like that. We oftentimes think about the material culture of indigenous communities, mm -hmm. um, and most definitely, and, and you know, of course, the the uh, the human remains that need to be repatriated to communities. But the language stuff was really not being looked at. It wasn't seen mm -hmm. as being the same thing. Those were scholarly texts. They were no longer the language. But for communities who had this severe interruption, sometimes that's all they had left. Right. And so one of the things that I really wanted to work on. And, and even moving out of kind of that late 18th century throughout the early 20th century, anthropologists, the students trained by Franz Boas, they were collecting um, uh, uh, grammatical sketches, stories, texts, and, and again, in universities and in, in museums. And so one of the things that I really wanted to do was how do you take this material mm -hmm. and reanimate Like a list it? Of, a vocabulary list or a grammatical text. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And none of this stuff is is more important than the speakers themselves. You know, that's right. the primary. Right. But right. when you're but when you want to kind of elaborate or create a language program, these things can be helpful. And mm -hmm. it's not even that they can even be helpful. They belong to the community. So right. one right. of my questions was, how can we bring this material um, it back into into the community? And so that's kind of where my focus was, was how do I take this this extant linguistic material mm -hmm. and and make it um usable again for mm -hmm. for communities. And so that's actually, in some ways, um, uh, you know, my career has kind of moved in, in, in different sorts of ways, but that primary interest is still the is the main one about how do we, yeah, how how does how does this material find its way back um, into community life? And so what have you found? How how can scholars, academics, um, and academic communities like ours sitting here in East Lansing help that work? Yeah, well, first of all, finding it, <laughs> finding the material. Um, yeah. Now, of course, it's changed, and this is the thing that's just been dramatic since the time I started kind of working in it, is the amount of material now that um, is, is available that you can, that uh, 
uh, archives have been kind of collecting materials and now they're digitizing it and things like that. Um, and so, uh, so, so one of the ways is, is still kind of a, a, a uh, trying to find um, materials. But then is really to, to kind of say, okay, you know, what's then to work with communities to see what's useful and what's not. You know, they ultimately have the decision as to what might be might, what might be helpful in these in these sorts of situations. And then, um, yeah, and and I guess it's just to kind of be as a support, and that's always how I see my my role is is as a yeah. support. Um, you know, is it an issue of and and there's so many really important sorts of questions. Um, it may seem like, oh, this is great, just move the materials back, but. That isn't true. Um, sometimes these materials are not appropriate. And actually, being from New Mexico, um, this has yeah. been a huge issue. And, and I'll let you, I know you know people who, who have this much more, but there's some esoteric material that communities don't want back. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's a real question about even access. And I remember I was on the very early stages of, um, it's so funny, it completely dates me, but we were making, we were at the very first kind of the multimedia language lesson. So at the, I oh, worked cool. with a community, yep. um, the Fort Belknap Reservation up in North Central Montana. And we we were creating kind of very rudimentary uh, uh, multimedia language lessons. So you would click on a, a picture right. and it would say the Nakota word for it. Yep. Um, I remember some of those when I was taking Spanish in college. Yep, just like yeah. that. Yes. And they used to, we actually had to burn them on CDs. And you had yeah, to be oh, so yeah, careful which about- Oh yeah, our students will not know what that is. But yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but and, and so so one of my or what do I you know what do I see universities can do is is certainly be um, be advocates and be supports for making sure that that communities have the technology that they want, not what academics think they need, but what they yeah. actually want. Because yeah. again, even with some of this kind of opening up, um, uh, there's you know concerns about you know who has access to to some of the language materials and who has the authority. The community authority to kind of teach it, and so, um, so it's it's to be kind of that to be to be a, a liaison or a conduit um, between these repositories and the communities, and figure out kind of like yeah how how best to bring them back mm -hmm. and how the communities want it back. Um, one of the things we've talked about with Canterbury MSU and is at All Saints as well as you well know. I should have said that you're also a member of All Saints Episcopal Church. That's how I we am indeed know each I other. Is we have talked a lot about systemic racism and how we as a predominantly white community um, can deal with our systemic racism. I think it's important to note that that's our problem. That is not the problem of communities of color. Systemic racism is a white issue. And so it's our work to do and to deal with it. It occurs to me listening to you in a way that I feel a little dumb for not having put all together before that um, supporting, funding, um, getting to know anthropology programs could be really important for addressing systemic racism. Just a yeah. little plug there for the humanities. <laughs> I, so. I would think so. I mean, and, 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 and not because we, it's because uh, anthropology has been steeped in it for so long. Exactly. And, right. um, and these, and a lot of what, you know, feels like this awakening over the last few years in the US, you know, anthropology has been there for a while, not because they're better than, but because they've been actually steeped in it. Yeah. Um, and anthropologists are, are continually still having to to kind of reckon with these these ideas. But no, most definitely, um, th these are the conversations that we've been having for mm -hmm. a very long time. Um, yeah. So it, uh, I, and I should oh, one of the things I, I was going to back to just even the language. Um, I, I kind of went full force into into kind of what I do with it, but there is also an educational aspect to. Because and 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 this ties into the issue of systemic racism. You know, first of all, there is a, a just a general lack of knowledge about the diversity of, yeah. of of indigenous communities in the United States, and that absolutely applies to indigenous languages. People don't recognize not only how many there are, how very different they are from each other, um, uh, their own particular you know the history of of, um, of the oppression of the languages, but then. There's even still, and this is the thing that I find most surprising is that I, I think, of course, you know, we think about, you know, the language that we speak, we use language for everything, for, you know, for poetry, for expressing ourselves and our identity. And, and, and I, as a, as a first language English speaker, I love English. Mm -hmm. English is beautiful and it's, but these languages are too. <laughs> and I, there is right. still a perception. And I guess that's one of the things that I find um, uh, troubling is that, people don't understand exactly how complex 
and how um, you know, yes, it, and and how how much worldview as a whole is kind of embedded in language, yeah. and how uh, yeah, and how we're at risk of of losing that. And again, it's not that. And I, I want to be very careful. I do not think that white people need to start learning indigenous languages. I mean, it's fine if they want to learn about them. That's fine. It's but right. it's a community's prerogative. Yes, but they absolutely need to learn about them in the way that these are, because there is still a lot of stigma and um, a sense that somehow these languages are less than. And yeah. and I, even beyond indigenous studies, I, I see that there's still a ranking of languages that people think, oh well, this language is just more suited. You know that right. we wouldn't have computers if we didn't have English, which is you know as a linguistic anthropologist, that's pure bunk. <laughs> that's right. that's absurd. That's, I mean, that's an absurd idea. Yeah. It is. It's yeah. an absurd idea, but still remarkably prevalent. Yeah. So, so there is an educational aspect to um, uh, that, a general awareness of, mm -hmm. of in fact, um, linguistic diversity, mm -hmm. both in the United States and around the world, that I think is, is uh, that we absolutely must talk about more uh, because it then it helps to uh, lessen then even some of the, again, these, these prejudices and biases against communities of color. Mm -hmm. Um, growing up in New Mexico, which is a at least bilingual state community, and and truly more than that, as you talk about exactly Native American. I mean, I grew up surrounded by languages that I knew nothing about, um, but many surrounded by many different languages. In in worship, we would often say, and and it happens in communities where there is a little bit of diversity. You don't have to have a lot. Um, that that we will often say, like if we're starting the Lord's Prayer, which is something that we all, you know, that we often recite together, we'll say, you know, recite this in in the language of your heart or in the language that you wish or um, in the language in which you pray, recognizing that that no matter how fluent you are in other languages, there are some things that cannot be expressed outside of your mother tongue, outside of the language that shaped you and formed the the most inherent parts of your being, your relationship to God, to the universe, um, to your closest kin, you know, those, those bonds that love them or hate them are inextricable, you know, that, yeah, that language does that, yeah. um, that can't, and things that cannot be translated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and things, and one of the things I, I teach in my, in my classes here at MSU is that you know, ultimately it's not that any language is limiting, right? We can say any sort of concept, but the way in which you say it yeah. draws your attention to certain sorts of things. There's a feeling, there's an aesthetic value to these things. And it's not necessarily about the communication of a concept. It's about these, these other sort of things that, that are exactly what you're talking about. And, and language means more than just a simple communication of a thought. It's, a, yeah. it's yeah. of, of, and it's those other sorts of things that, that really defy translation. Yeah, I am I am far from fluent in Spanish, um, but grew up with a lot of Spanglish. And and I will hear myself say things in Spanish occasionally um, for exactly that reason, because I'm not talking about the words or the concept. I'm 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 talking about home. I'm talking about the smell and the taste and the feel of something. It's memories of hanging out with my friends in high school and you know, throwing words around. And it's that kind of stuff that language carries. Absolutely. Incredibly powerful. Absolutely. And I would just even put in a plug there for Spanglish. Spanglish as much as it's not oh, absolutely. Spanglish is as fully and as, right. as you know. It, yeah, that's to, not a pejorative at all. I mean, yeah. we really do speak Spanglish. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Sure. That, and, and there are some things that you say, even at, you know, at home, home is Albuquerque, um, that 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 people who are move, more fluent in both than I am, but but all of us, there are things you say in English, no matter what your your stronger language is and there are things you say in spanish all the time no matter what you really speak um because language is fluid that way which yeah. is really fun it is it is that's what yeah that's what's kept me engaged <laughs> for all these years i just i, I, love I get it. it yeah yeah i i totally understand the fascination yeah um so you and i are both transplants to mid michigan Mm -hmm. um, these are not the native communities that we grew up around and not the communities that you've researched. Um, but you've been here a while. I have. Tell, tell me about the native indigenous communities here. Native sure. Slash, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, um, I was very lucky and, and, and actually kind of even to reference back to the, to the land acknowledgement. So I was really lucky. I was hired at MSU when the American Indian Studies program actually started. 
Wow. So prior to um, prior to my coming here, I, I didn't start. So there was this wonderful group of people. So we have the Native American Institute at um, at Michigan State University, and um, it's a it's a great sort of resource, and it's been a resource for tribes, for, as you said, the, the twelve um, recognized tribes, but we have other communities as well um, in in Michigan. And so the Native American Institute was actually is still um, in the in the uh, in the School of Agriculture, and it's really a, a, an out outreach. Um, program and it's been a, rem a remarkable resource for many many decades for tribes to kind of get access to information. There's been grants and things like that. But a group that was with the Native American Institute said, you know, we really need it. We want uh, an academic program, and mm -hmm. so they started the American Indian Studies program, um, basically in the year that I came, which was 2000 2001. And um, they really wanted to have uh, kind of so kind of the academic arm of what of of what the Native American Institute had been doing but that people that students could get a degree. And so it started as, a, as an undergraduate specialization. Um, and I was actually hired in, uh, in its kind of inaugural year as a pre-doctoral fellow and then ended up staying, um, which has just been <laughs> remarkable <laughs> and wonderful. So I feel like I have learned um, a tremendous yeah. amount about the, the, the Michigan communities. And one of the first things is that, um, so uh, for the Anishinaabeg community, and so there, are, you know, we, as as you acknowledged in the in the land acknowledgement, um, the three the three fires, the Odawa, the Potawatomi, and um, the Ojibwe, but they all see themselves. They all speak Anishinaabemowin, and they all consider themselves Anishinaabeg. Say that again for me. I've learned Anishinaabeg, but say the language for me again. Anishinaabemowin. So Mowin would be the the language of the okay. Tonga. Yeah. Okay. Great. Anishinaabemowin. Thank yeah. you. I, I, now that you explained, I understand. Anishinaabe Mowin. Yeah, Anishinaabe Mowin. Yeah. So that's so. So all of these communities uh, do speak that. And what I was, you know, for me, I was coming from the West, where they have these tremendous, you know, kind of really large um, reservations and these yes. really large states. And there's this kind of, you know, as you transit those spaces, you know, when you're going in. That's what right. I was, what's remarkable to me, and back to the land acknowledgement, is that Michigan is. <laughs> This is the Anishinaabe territory, the yes. whole space, and um, and you're always in that space. And I think that that's one of the things that's uh, really important, even here in Lansing. And yeah. um, I shouldn't say Thank even you. here in Lansing, especially here in Lansing. Um, Lansing for for you know centuries has been a crossroads. Uh, it's where the the rivers meet, um, and it's sure. where a lot of communities have come in and out. Um, if there were you know some, some some kind of more permanent than others, but but it's always been very much um, a space and. When I first came, um, so I had a lot of learning to do. Uh, and one of the things, though, I guess, so uh, there's so many, so many people um, in the in the mid Michigan area. Um, uh, and there was a, a, a Michigan Indian, uh, the, the Woodland Center that was here in uh, Lansing has been a really important uh, center for for indigenous communities. And of course, you cannot understate the importance of the car industry. Um, so a lot of people came right. to. Um, came to the Lansing area uh, to work in the, in the car industry, particularly from kind of around, kind of surrounding the Great Lakes, but including then Southern Ontario. So a lot of okay. folks from um, Wik Wikwemagong, um, which is Manitoulin Island, uh, a lot of the speakers in the area um, kind of hail from that, from that area. So it's a really interesting and kind of diverse mm -hmm. space. And I guess that's one of the things that kind of struck me at, at first. And then um, and then also, again, I'm particularly interested in, in issues of language and how much um, of Anishinaabe Mwin is actually still spoken. Um, there's actually quite a bit and uh, uh, they've had real longstanding language programs in and around this area, but, uh, but also in, the, in, in, the, in various places in the upper lower <laughs> um, peninsula, um, Bay Mills College, um, a lot of places have had really successful immersion programs for, for quite a number of decades. So one of the, um, there's a great conference that happens annually. It's called Anishinaabe Mwin Tech Conference. And it off, it's, it's up at Sault Ste. Marie and uh -huh. it kind of goes back and forth between, before COVID, Back and forth between the Canadian side and the and US. after COVID, there is yes. going to be an after COVID. Exactly, and after COVID. I reminded myself of just the other day. There is going to be an after COVID. Yes. There is going to be. Yes. Um, but I remember going up to that conference, and so it brings in speakers from Michigan, um, from Southern Ontario, from um, Minnesota and Wisconsin, of course, because there's a lot of speakers there. Mm -hmm. And I had been spending, you know, a decade or so working in the Northern Plains, where of course I heard the Indigenous language, but it was it was it, it, they were in more kind of prescribed sort of situation. I was in this conference and all I heard in the hallways was Anishinaabe Mawin. I mean, it was oh, the most incredible cool. sort of 
immersive experience. Yeah. And, um, and I guess that's another thing to know about or that, you know, about Michigan is that there's certainly, you know, the Michigan communities and Michigan tribes, but the connections to Wisconsin, to um, Minnesota right. are very strong, um, to, to Ontario are, are very, very strong. And, um, and there's a lot of exchange, just as there's always been a tremendous exchange between these communities. Mm -hmm. Over the, the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, I was posting information about Native communities and doing some, my own, some of my own education because I've only been here two and a half years. And um, it's interesting that you talk about the borders that, that actually clarify some stuff for me because I came here trying to figure out where those borders were. You know, where do you step onto the reservation? Where is the, you know, the place you go for the feast day? Where, you know, where, where is the place? But you've explained it to me that I'm in it. <laughs> Yeah, you are. Yeah, I'm in it. <laughs> yeah, my first ghost supper was at Otto Middle School in North Lansing. Cool. You know, so it's cool. a, it it right. really is, and that's and I I know what you're you're feeling because I I remember the first time I went up to, of course, um, uh, Mount Pleasant, where uh, which is kind of the bigger uh, city I guess or town in the Isabella Reservation, which is of course for the, the home for Saginaw Chippewa, mm -hmm. but but it doesn't it it's not the same sort of feeling because it is right. it is all kind of it is all around and i especially feel this uh this past summer we were up in the up um mm -hmm. and um hannaville that's right there you know it's just right there in escanaba so there's not these real sort of yeah th those boundaries are not fixed and they're not fixed because they're it's 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 everywhere that's the way oh, i prefer yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah the pasqua yaki village in tucson is a little bit more like that is there's a village that's you know kind of in tucson as well as sort of on the edge yeah so thank you that helps um shift my own understanding of where i'm sitting that's really helpful um yeah yeah so one of the things again because systemic racism is the work of white folks um I think understanding our history is really important and how we got to this place that, that we are a country that is founded essentially on genocide. Um, and, and so a question that I, I commonly find myself asking myself and others is what is it that we as white folks have lost as these communities have been suppressed? Because we often think that, that the only harm that's done is to, to the communities that have been traumatized, violated, suppressed, et cetera. But, but I think we also lose something in that, that, that healing racism is, is to everyone's benefit. Um, so, so what is it that we lose as we lose connection with these communities? Yeah, well, first and foremost, a whole lot of knowledge. Um, we learn, a we lose a whole lot of knowledge about this place that we now um, live together, right? And um, and again, this for me is very much embedded in the language um, that uh, uh, to me, and, and when we kind of think about kind of maintenance of communities, it's also maintenance of language um, and these things go. And uh, uh, as I said before, I don't like to think of kind of languages as, 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 as dead or dying, but we can talk about endangered languages. And one of the problems of endangered languages really speaks to the fact that we're really talking about endangered people, right? You're, you're talking, right. you're not right. just talking about a language system losing that you're you're losing the people themselves and right. that that should be just on a humanitarian basis um deeply both troubling yeah. and upsetting yeah. um but within this these are knowledge systems these are knowledge about how this particular how these places work how they've yeah. worked historically um some guides to how they're going to work in the future and there's been so much in the, back to even kind of what i've been impressed with in michigan you know there's so much of this knowledge about how do we heal our waters mm -hmm. how do we heal our 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 land through techniques that indigenous communities have known mm -hmm. forever. They've been, that have survived despite being told that they were wrong and ends up, they're actually pretty darn right. right. Um, uh, and they know think, something. Yeah. yeah, like the whole restoration of the wild rice. Um, oh, right. Uh, wild rice in, in Michigan. So, you know, wild ricing is very important to Anishinaabe communities, um, a, a staple of diets, uh, you know, a, a seasonal round in terms of when, when the rice is done and how to, to procure it. But in Michigan in particular, you know, we've lost a lot of the beds um, through env environmental mm -hmm. damage, and, but learning how to restore them, you mm -hmm. need to have the communities who know how to restore them, restore them. Yeah. And it's not just about restoring this particular resource for the Anishinaabe communities, which is important, but it's about keeping our land actually healthy. Um, and we've learned so much about how those sort of environmental practices, you know, they're, they're grounded in both practice 
practicality, but but in a tremendous amount of wisdom about um, about how the how the earth works. And so um, it's not to be it's not to be. I don't want to fall into kind of a popular trope about environmentalism among indigenous communities, but there is a tremendous amount of knowledge there, and we saw this. Um, we see this in Michigan, particularly with uh, with the care of the rivers and the and the and the lakes. We see it out west with the the protest at Standing Rock against yeah. the the um, the pipeline. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of of knowledge that that all of us really it really behooves us to listen mm -hmm. a lot a lot more. Um, and then I think there's also again talking about the history of the uh, of of the U.S. in particular, um, and I think about this. Uh, you know, we do need to know this history. The history is not is not um, a positive history, right? There's a there's right. an incredible amount of violence, but yep. that violence we need to reckon with that. We need to know about that because it is continuing and it will continue, and that destabilizes everybody. Absolutely. Um, and it's not about you know teaching white folks a lesson. Well, it is, <laughs> but not only. <laughs> it's, not, it's not about saying white folks you did so wrong, but. Right. These are wrongs that were done, and we got to figure out how to not do them anymore because yeah. it is not sustainable for anybody. That's it's, right. We're not just going to lose these communities; we're going to lose right. our own. That's right. Um, and, uh, and 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 that, my concern is that before we actually lose our ourselves, you know, before our own communities are violently destroyed, we're going to lose our souls. Absolutely. You know, it is not healthy, sane to be a violent oppressor. Neither neither side of that equation is right no no and it's and it goes back to the systemic part of it the structure of it um if if you have a system that is built that someone has to be weak and others to be for others to be strong then yeah. someone's going to always be in that weak position if the right. system only su supports itself and if we think about this in terms of the u.s history through the labor of, of blacks and uh, black americans and through the the land of, of indigenous americans yep. so if the system only works by on you know through the through, through the extraction of those two right. sorts of things the system is ultimately going to be duped um and I want to just kind of as a personal sort of anecdote. So my my extended family, I said I grew up in Colorado, but my extended family is from Wyoming. Um, and I still can, you know, spend a lot of summers in Wyoming. And my mother, um, a long time <laughs> Wyoming night, is sure she now no longer, she lives in the Twin Cities now, but she's like, Wyoming is going to collapse in and of itself, in on itself, because it is extracted so yes. much. Um, the economy of Wyoming is um is natural gas, it is. Um, it is is minerals. It is, and they they're soon going to go yeah. because perhaps literally. I mean, that's what she's right. I mean, Wyoming might become a big sinkhole. Exactly. You can't, out of you take out all of the strata of the earth itself. It crumbles, literally there, crumbles. There is some point we're where seeing that in the West. Yeah. Yes, and so I I always kind of think about her in that sort of, and I take that as a metaphor. Yeah, or a lot of kind of what U.S. society we will collapse in on yeah. ourselves, um, and everyone will suffer yeah. if we continue on this way. And we need to hear, we need to hear the stories um, of the past, and we need to continue to listen to to yeah. people's current um, issues if we're going to have any chance of, of of escaping that sort of thing. I don't mean to be so depressing about it, but I really do see this <laughs> as, as a concern. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I think that, I think the, the way we get out of the demoralizing part of that is what you said. And this comes up, this has come up in, in almost every one of these conversations I've done this semester. It, it's the listening piece. Um, and we are not good at that. The, the white part of our culture has not been taught to listen very well. We're, we're taught to, um, speak up and speak out and control a situation and, you know, gain leverage and all that. I talked about some of this in my sermon yesterday. Um, you know, those are the things that we're taught. We are not taught to listen well. Right. And, and I agree with you that, that we are going to collapse upon ourselves and, and our, our way out of that is to do exactly what you're talking about, to, to value communities that, that really have a great deal to teach us. Absolutely. They've been here longer. Right, and those stories have persisted. They know, they know the place, and um, and yeah, and 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 their knowledge has to be respected. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. so Thank I have a funny story about a anthropologist. Uh, 
an anthropologist, unfortunately, he recently passed away, but was a, a, a person who worked amongst the Cherokee community for a very long time. And he remembers working with a Cherokee elder who told him to go out and collect all of these plants because mm-hmm. we're going to talk about kind of medicinal knowledge. And of course, Cherokee systems of, of, yeah. of medicine are quite extensive with, mm-hmm. with plants. And so he went out and he chopped off all the tops of the, the plants and he brought it back. And the elder was like, what are you doing? Right. You need the root. And I find that is also a really kind of uh, telling that yeah. you need to, <laughs> there's so much, you know, you think you know what you know, but you don't. Um, he thought he was ex- doing such a great top, job right. of identifying these plants. And then he brings back these tops that were completely useless because right. he, he left the most important thing in the in the in the ground. <laughs> um, yeah, and their whole was, purpose is just to keep the plant in the ground alive. Yeah, right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And so, um, and so that back to the point. listening piece that you know that yeah. you you really do have to kind of listen. There's an incredible amount of of, of knowledge that um, uh, that needs to be uh, respected. Mm-hmm. The Episcopal Diocese of Northern Michigan has been involved in reconciliation work for a long time, particularly among Native and White communities. And at a presentation they did at a provincial event, um, I can't figure it out with COVID in the middle, two years ago, I think, something 18 months ago, um, pre-COVID. One of the the native leaders of that work put up a slide um, talking about sort of how you do this work. And and she said and read that, that white communities want to jump to reconciliation without listening to the stories. And, and you, it doesn't work that way. You can't have real reconciliation if you haven't actually listened to the harm that's done, to the wisdom that's been missed and that is there waiting to be embraced without the real learning. Absolutely. And this is something I've talked to students about and I've talked to, to family members about too, which is that there is this idea that somehow and, and this oftentimes gets put on indigenous communities that they're that there's still this idea that they're more noble, right? That they're yeah. they can give forgiveness and they can give, you know, and 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 people get upset when they're put in uncomfortable positions. And my point is that you have to feel uncomfortable. If you don't feel uncomfortable, then it's not you can't move to that. You can't right. you can't move to that space. That's Again, right. uh, you know, black indigenous people of color felt uncomfortable for a really, really long time. And how yeah. can we as as white folk, our turn. Think that we can be, we can move to reconciliation without feeling exactly excluded, right? Um, uh, we, we we can't feel excluded if we can't feel threatened. Um, these communities have felt threatened for a very long time. How do we think that we can move to reconciliation without actually viscerally feeling yeah. these things? And um, you know, I find myself lucky that I've been able to be in. Indigenous communities as as a white person as a non-indigenous person, but that does not mean I'm like accepted with open arms. I have absolutely I have I have absolutely been excluded. I have been yelled at. I have been, and that is my I that is my role. And yeah. um and I'm not. They're not there to make me feel comfortable. Right. Um and uh and I think that that's still the lesson that so many people. Are unwilling to uh, to to go through is to feel that truly that they are yeah yeah they're, that they are not welcome <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah and and only after that can we then even entertain a discussion of how do we move forward you yeah. know because after that then there can be recognition on a deeper level mm-hmm. and an idea of okay we are we are shared humans in this and how do we how do we move forward then together. Um, But that can't happen until there's that that deep sort of recognition. Yeah, that reminds me of sacramental confession because I'm a priest. (laughs) Um, And in the Episcopal Church, like the Roman Catholic Church, we practice sacramental confession. Not a lot of Episcopalians do it, but it's an option. Um, And and it is incredibly powerful for exactly all the reasons we're talking about. Um, It's not pleasant (laughs) to go and sit down with an actual other human being um, and say things out loud that that are embarrassing or cause guilt or shame is, is not fun. It, it is not a comfortable experience. Um, and yet it's the only way you get to the part, to the moment of absolution, of healing. Um, and there's almost nothing better than that on this side of the veil, <laughs> on, on this side of, of God's creation. Um, 
it, it's an amazing experience, but you've got to go through the bad part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you can't shortcut this one. <laughs> no, no. In fact, the the more, I mean, <laughs> this is, <laughs> I'm a priest, I can't help it. The, you know, the more real, authentic, scary, deep, gnarly a confession is, the more real and whole and complete absolution is. I mean, it, there's just, that's just the way it works. Yeah. Well, can I get real personal? I don't know if this yeah. is going to be, you can, you can edit this out if it's you can decide. Yeah. <laughs> one thing I often get asked by um, colleagues um, mm-hmm. and even by other, even kind of uh, other people who are Christian, how can I be Episcopalian given the history of the Episcopal church with indigenous uh. communities? Um, and the answer actually lies in what we were just talking about yeah. is that um, you know, I'm, I'm very upfront. I am not indigenous. I am, I am white. Um, I know where my families are you know, kind of from and our, our own sort of personal histories. But when I was living on the reservation, and so I left, lived at Fort Belknap for um, about a year and then went back over the course of three or four years. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always amazed at people's faith. Uh, and people would, you know, they would take part in, it was, largely missionized by the Catholics. So there were a lot of people who were mm-hmm. Catholic. So indigenous folks who were Catholic, but so they would, they would go to Catholic church, but then also take place in, or take part in the, um, in the medicine lodge. And so, you know, had, but, but this real deep, deep sort of, um, of, of faith um, in a plurality of, of practices. And, um, and one of the things that one of the people there kind of reminded me is that it doesn't, she's like, well, who are you? And she asked me, who am I? Um, now at that point I happened to be Methodist, so <laughs> but, <laughs> Episcopalian came a little bit later when I when I got married, but I was right at that transition actually between Methodism yeah. and Episcopalian. Yeah. And so I told her, and she's like, it's really important that you know who you are and that you that you know it doesn't matter what you are, it just matters that you're something, right? And that yeah. um and it, it just really mattered. And I couldn't like the last thing I would do it would be to pretend to take on kind of indigenous spirituality. Right. Right. And the thing that kind of kept on being told is your stories are your stories. And my stories are the Christian stories. And I need to, those, that's who I am. That's where I come from. That's where I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. I need to embrace those stories. And I also need to embrace that past, even right. though it might be a difficult past. Um, I do think the Episcopal church is dealing with it and grappling with it. And, right. um, and so you don't leave it because it had a, uh, a checkered past, you, you, you stay with it because it has a better future. Um, yeah, right. And, exactly. And, and uh, because, because it is ours, because it is our story, it's like racism is we have an obligation to be here and to help heal it. That is, right. that is our job as members of this body. Mm-hmm. Um, and to walk away from it without doing that work, I think would be as, um, abhorrent for lack of a better word that's what comes to me abhorrent as denying as sitting here and enjoying the riches of this tradition and denying um the harm that it's done as well right yeah and again you know I, just the people that that i've known and you probably know them too in your life that these folks who just tell you truth on a, on a level that you know and and this idea yep. that you have to you know to believe in nothing is far worse <laughs> yeah that you have to have, you need to yeah. have that, that yeah. you have to have that guide through your, yeah. through your life. And, yeah. Um, so yeah, Absolutely. anyways. Well, we began with the land acknowledgement. So given that it seems fitting to me um, to end with um, a short recognition or conversation about the doctrine of discovery that recently the Episcopal church um, at our general convention, our largest governing body of the Episcopal church that we have rejected the doctrine of discovery. The way I understand the doctrine of discovery, right, is that that somehow um, uh, that that you have uh, authority over the places which you um, yeah which you inhabit it, right? So that you that you have um, kind of uh, the responsibility and um, ability to to control this the spaces that you, you know, quote unquote. I'm going to see that this is why right. we've, we've rejected it, right? The yeah. quote unquote doctrine of discovery that. Um, whoever finds it keeps it, um, right? And whoever finds it manages it, and whoever you know. And so, and what it does, of course, is it prioritizes, um, particularly the Western European um, imperialism that uh, that said that lands and peoples were not knowable until they knew them, right. um, and were not 
uh, understandable until they understood them. Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, and so the reject, of course, what that does is it wipes out an incredible amount of humanity and their own ability to both kind of represent themselves and um, yeah. govern themselves and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and know themselves yeah. in, a, in a way. And then practically, um, gave, gave us, we took, um, the right to use the land and its resources, however we saw fit. Um, right. So using up water, polluting all kinds of natural ecosystems, um, and and just expanding across the land with no regard um, for the peoples who already lived there. Right. Um, so it was 2009 that the Episcopal Church repudiated the doctrine of discovery, acknowledging that that we and our ancestors participated in that. And, and that we have work to do to heal that. Um, and that repudiation is not a one-time thing. That is an ongoing process within the Episcopal Church and other Christian bodies um, in North America. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. This has been Thank a wonderful you. conversation. I've learned so much. I hope that students watching will um, learn much and, and come sign up for classes in, in the department. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I have learned so much and really enjoyed this time cool. with you. So thanks, Mindy. All right. Take care.